Dear chairmen, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to be here and I would especially like to thank the organizers and especially Patrick for inviting me to this important conference and to give me the opportunity to talk about new endpoints and biomarkers for treatment of hepatitis B. As you're probably aware, there have, since uh, now several years, there are regular endpoint conferences as a joint effort of ESL and ASLD really to help to provide guidance for the design and endpoint of new clinical trials in chronic hepatitis B. And this slide is a kind of a summary of what the, the, the committee came up as a kind of recommendation, what could be the future and the future endpoints in chronic hepatitis B. B and uh, you can see here from, let's say, left to the right, it's more easy or the other way more difficult to achieve these different endpoints, starting from sterilizing cure to attainable partial functional cure. And you see, can see here below that the clinical scenario. What does it really mean? And the sterilizing cure means you achieve something by treating a patient as he would never be infected or recovery after acute hepatitis B or what we are aiming so far is a functional cure, so it means a chronic hepatitis B virus infection and then you achieve a NAS loss. But what is new here with the new um, guidance that they introduced a kind of an attainable partial functional cure where it's not necessarily um, a prerequisite that you lose S, but that you are really coming to a true inactive carrier states where all the disease activity markers are, let's say, inactive and you have a very good outcome in the long term. Well, in 2017, in the guideline, it's already written that S loss is an optimal endpoint, and it's so because it indicates a profound suppression of HPV replication and viral protein expression. But you may raise the point that there's probably some inconsistency in this argumentation because our treatment indication is not based on S, it's based on the phases of the chronic infection and disease activity markers like HPV DNA and ALT. So the question is why we are aiming for S loss if S antigen per se is not an indicator to start antiviral treatment. Well, and again, in the guideline, it was already written that when asking the question why we are aiming for S loss and what is the best surrogate for achieving long-term benefit for our patients, as chronic HPV infection cannot be completely eradicated due to the persistence of CCC DNA and integrated HPV DNA, it remains unclear whether S loss adds to the prevention of the long-term complications of chronic hepatitis B virus infection beyond what can be achieved by the suppression of HPV DNA replication alone. And you have heard from Professor Lim that the main goal of treatment is to prevent adverse disease outcome. And we know that HCC may develop after spontaneous S loss, although at a lower rate, and if you achieve S loss quite early, during the course of the infection, the risk is probably very low. So the question again is, do we need to achieve S loss um, and is it needed to fully prevent any adverse outcome? And since we wrote the guideline in 2017 where there was no evidence, we now have one study really exploring whether S loss in addition to complete suppression of HPV DNA by long-term NUC treatment has any benefit. And from this large study from Hong Kong, it appears that if you have complete suppression, it's better than you have a minimal residual viral disease where the risk of HCC is higher. But if you are able to use S0 conversion or S loss, S0 clearance, then the risk for HEC is lower. So this is the first study really showing that achieving S loss may add something to viral suppression or beyond viral suppression. 
However, with respect to hepatic events, this means cirrhosis progression, ascites, bleeding, and so on, there was no difference whether S loss was achieved or it's just a complete viral suppression. But you see, if you have minimal residual viremia, this has an effect on long-term complication. And the same holds true for liver-related mortality, where, um, again, S loss did not add to this endpoint. And the second point that is always raised is when having S and the functional cure as a main endpoint for new treatments is a point that HBS antigen we are measuring in blood can come from both disease activity markers like the activity of CCC DNA transcription and later on translation and from integration. And our treatment strategies in order to target integrated HPV DNA are probably completely different and it's much more complicated probably to, to solve the problem of integration. And this was also an issue why uh, the committee thought as loss should not only be the, the only endpoint when um, considering new um, treatments. So, but if the patient is still positive, and we do allow us at a good endpoint really to achieve this inactive carrier, of course, there's always the question, what about the stability if S is still there? Is there any risk of disease uh, reactivation? What about the long-term HCC risk and so on? And therefore, the question is again, what do we really know about the, let's say, inactivity of inactive carriers or called the E-negative chronic infection? And there's an interesting new study, again, coming from uh, Asia, from China, where they looked at certain baseline levels in these inactive carriers and followed them for long term and looked to phase transition. When does these uh, patients, they are starting with an inactive status, when they have a phase transition to a more active disease. And you see, here are the different levels of HPV DNA and TALT, and in blue is very low. So if a patient starts in the, uh, in the category of HPV DNA below 100, the risk of phase transition is very minimal. They normally stay within their range. However, if they have higher levels, then the chance that they may end up with high level replication and initiated treatment is higher. So to show you kind of a Kaplan-Meier analysis, you see the risk of phase transition if you start with an HPV DNA less than 100 is really over the years very low. Can we in the same way use levels of HPV, uh, HPS antigen uh, as a progression marker? So does the level matches? And the question is probably yes for those patients having low HPV DNA level. So if you look in an untreated cohort with less than 2,000 EU um, HPV DNA, it matters whether you have high or low HBS antigen here with a cutoff of 1,000 with respect of the reactivation into E-negative hepatitis or cirrhosis development. And when you look at the risk of HCC, again, if you have low HPV DNA and very low HBS antigen level, you are in the minimal risk group for developing HCC. And this is all studies done in untreated patients, so describing the natural course, if you like, of inactive carriers or E-negative infection. So the question now is, we have new biomarkers, and are these new biomarkers helpful in order to predict the long-term outcome better than what we have so far with S antigen levels, with HPV DNA, and with um, ALT, so to come to a more refined characterization of the activity of the infection. And here we have several markers, and I would like only to focus on the circulating serum markers. Um, describing disease activity, it's a correlated antigen and the circulating RNA, so-called the HPV RNA. I would briefly mention the components of the HBS antigen and quite briefly also quantitative anti-HBC antibodies. Let's start with correlated antigen. And you know correlated antigen is a composite marker, it contains core E antigen, but also the, of course, the, the viral particles and the truncated po correlated protein. And the important point here that the correlated antigen 
not like HPS antigen, is not influenced by translation of integrated sequences. So what you found in the blood when you're measuring correlated antigen, it relates to transcription of the CCC DNA. And there has been nicely shown that there's a clear correlation between the transcriptional activity of CCC DNA, not so much the amount of CCC DNA, but really the transcriptional activity of CCC DNA and the correlated antigen you can find in the blood. And it also depends on the phases of, of the chronic infection and the lower disease activity, the lower the correlated antigen. And it has been shown that even if you compare to histological markers, um, you can see that the levels of HB um, hepatitis B correlated antigen are normally lower in those with low necroinflammatory activity fibrosis and also correlated to the ALT level. But probably even more important, it's a predictive marker for long-term outcome and especially for the risk of developing HCC. Again, here in untreated patients with low level HPV DNA at baseline, and you see there's a clear correlation in these patients with similar levels of HPV DNA, whether correlated levels are high or low with a long-term risk of HCC. And you see it's a much better predictor as compared to S levels. These are the AROC analysis and correlated antigen outperformed S in this respect. <clears throat> Let's move forward to HPV RNA, and HPV RNA is probably the best direct marker of transcriptional activity we have in chronic hepatitis B, so you can directly measure probably pregenomic but also other RNA molecules in form of incomplete variants or capsid-bound particles in the blood, giving you an, a hint and a clear description of also the intrahepatic pregenomic RNA content, as has been nicely shown in several studies. So it's really a good marker for CCC DNA activity. Is it also a disease activity marker? The answer is probably yes. Here are um, the correlation of different biomarkers in patients with different phases of the chronic infection. And we know that S antigen levels in the inactive carrier and the E negative chronic infection phase are normally lower. But you see there's a lot of overlap also with the active phases. But if you look at HPV RNA in the inactive uh, phases, there's normally no RNA detectable. And this could be also confirmed that the level of both intrahepatic but also serum HV RNA correlates with the grading and staging of the disease in people being under treatment with a NUC. And the higher the disease activity, even under NUC, the higher the RNA level. So it's probably also an interesting disease activity marker. And it is also used to predict treatment response. And you can see there are different kinetics, whereas nearly all patients achieved undetectable HPV DNA level. You still may see HPV RNA in blood, so there are patients achieving RNA negative, others not. But you can see here, in comparison to HPS antigen, it really tells you something different. You can have a nice decline in RNA, but probably no decline in S. So these are really markers describing different biologies of the hepatitis B virus infection. And it's believed that under long-term treatment, and this could be interesting for all the new compounds, you start with declining HPV DNA, but then in the long run, if you also see a declining in RNA, this may tells you that you have now a declining activity of the CCC DNA transcriptional activity. Some brief words to the HPS components. This is relatively new. There are only in-house assays and we need more data. But you know that the envelope protein of hepatitis B virus is composed of different forms or components of S, the large, the middle, and the largest population is a small. I think it's not fully clear, but there is some belief that the large and probably the middle form of S only comes from transcription from CCC DNA and you will not find from the integration pre-S truncated um, uh, integrated forms. But as I mentioned, this has to be explored. But if true, it would be really a nice marker to 
differentiate between the um, HBS antigen coming from integration and from transcription. We know that it better describes the inactive carrier state. Again, you have seen the huge overlap for total HBS antigen between inactive and more active diseases. When you look at here, for instance, large but quite similar figures for middle S, much lower levels, less overlap for describing this inactivity disease. Well, I would like to come to the last part of my talk. And as was already mentioned in the ESL guideline, why we're aiming for S loss, I think the main advantage, and this still holds true, is if you achieve S loss, that it allows a safe discontinuation of antiviral therapy because it's really confirmed in many studies if you have S loss, this is mainly stable. The risk of reactivation without any immunosuppression, of course, is then very, very low. So the question again, have these new biomarkers also be explored whether they are helpful in predicting outcome after stopping finite treatment? There are not many data, but more data are coming up. And you know that if you stop long-term NUC treatment, again, the infection, the B infection, may run through different phases. And there may be some reactivation, not in all patients. And, but some of them really will enter a true inactive care state or even lose HBS antigen. And it has been shown in some of these studies that the markers of transcriptional activity like correlated antigen and pregenomic HPV RNA are able to predict the, let's say, optimal timing of therapy withdrawal. You see here patients with no flare after stopping mild or severe flare. And for HPV DNA, it's difficult really to judge what will happen when you stop. So this is the time point here. And also for S, it's less clear. But you see those starting with low correlated antigen levels or with lower HPV RNA levels and maintain low levels, the risk of, let's say, clinical reactivation is relatively low. And this was also shown some years ago uh, from a Chinese study where they showed that after stopping treatment, those with a viral rebound, and this were 24 patients, 21 of them had detectable HPV RNA. In contrast, if to look to those without any viral rebound, all were HPV RNA negative at end of treatment. And again, and this was a study in E positive patients achieving E zero conversion, and then some of them had a relapse and even in E zero reversion, it was shown that HPV RNA and end of treatment and follow up helped to predict that there will be no clinical relapse. They had a kind of an algorithm. So if you are end of treatment HPV DNA negative, and HPV RNA negative, then the likelihood of E0 reversion is zero in comparison to 11% if you are RNA positive, and also the risk of clinical and virologic relapse is much lower as compared to those stopping treatment after zero conversion in an, e, uh, in an HPV RNA positive state. The last word, and this is, I think we do not have really good data, but I think it's important to highlight that there are also an interest in quantitative anti-HBC levels. Normally, these levels are higher in patients with chronic infection as compared to those with resolved infection, and low anti-HBC levels are associated with S0 clearance. And there were interesting studies showing that the levels of anti-HBC also correlate with CCC DNA positive and can be associated with, immune, uh, with reactivation during immunosuppressive therapy. But there's a recent study in, in 2019 also correlating um, the quantitative anti-HBC levels with the risk of relapse after stopping treatment in a mixed population of E-positive and E-negative patients. And you see here, the higher the antibodies, the lower the risk of clinical relapse. So let me, um, to summarize, dear chairmen and colleagues, <clears throat> are these new biomarkers really helpful? especially in defining a group of patients with this partial functional cure. This means they are HBS antigen still positive. And I think probably with any new treatment, it would be advisable to achieve at least some lowering of HBS antigen. But this, if this is achieved together 
with a correlated antigen negative state. HPV RNA is negative, of course DNA, and we have to see how the, the HBS components and the anti-HBC antibodies also add to this description of the partial functional cure patient. I think we may really follow this patient and to see whether if you achieve really this type of inactive, non-transcriptional activity disease without any transcriptional activity, whether in the follow-up in the long run, we will see by nature, by the immune system whatsoever, more patients entering the functional or even complete cure state. So I thank you very much for your attention.